and uh, truly desiring that, truly wanting uh, God to utilize us in uh, the capacity that he uh, deems necessary, that he sees fit for each and every one of us. I'm grateful today that God uh, knows us, that he's created each and every one of us. And uh, it, unlike what maybe you think on occasions, uh, he didn't make a mistake when he did it. Uh, he made you just the way that you are. And man, I tell you what, he's... Um, in a in a very um, godly sense, he's proud of what he did, and uh, you ought to think about that and consider that, and, and be willing to operate with that mindset. And don't worry about what everyone else says about you. You know, don't worry about what others think so much about you. Worry about what God thinks, and what God uh, desires, and what God wants to do in and through you. And uh, when you find those areas of weakness, what do we what do we Remember, that's when God can show himself the strongest, and uh, that's a good thing. I hope everybody's doing okay this morning and that you've had a, uh, a good past week, all right? Uh, I don't, is, a good is a very relative term, isn't it? <laughs> Say define good. I kind of had a little bit of a stare this morning, so I'm not sure what that means. Uh, yeah, I can still see your eyes between your, uh, b- below your sunglasses. Hey, um, today is also our 39th anniversary of the existence of this church. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. And uh, I would, not, not that I want you to be distracted from the message uh, that, or the lesson we're going to go over this morning, but in the back of your mind, I do want you to be thinking about, you know, if there's something that you can share, uh, we might have just a few different options or opportunities uh, throughout the day. Uh, something you can share of how this church has been a blessing to your life uh, might be a good a good way to just kind of commemorate a little bit. We're not we're not having cake. I'm sorry. Uh, we're not. And I'm really not sorry. Uh, uh, now we're not having pie. That I am sorry about. All right, but uh, no cake. Uh, but uh, still thanking the Lord for His faithfulness, and uh, in turn wanting to be faithful uh, to uh, Him. Uh, because he is so faithful to us, and uh, I'm I'm so thankful that we have that reciprocating opportunity. Because what God has done in our life, we can in turn do the same back uh, to Him, and that's a wonderful aspect of the relationship opportunity we have uh, with the Lord. Well, we're talking about the subject of repentance. Look over at Luke chapter 24. We'll start there and use that to springboard into uh, the things that we want to cover here this morning. Uh, again, as we consider the, uh, the basic element of um, why we're here and what we've been uh, left on the earth for, it is to witness to others and to share Christ and to uh, preach uh, the gospel. And that's a, uh, a necessary uh, aspect of the life that, that God has uh, encouraged us to live here on this earth. And uh, even more so, as we see... Uh, these uh, the, the times changing as we see the uh, the, the the greater possibilities of uh, the prophetic statements regarding what we would say the end times to come to pass, and uh, all the more uh, diligence that we should commit and give uh, the attention we should give to preaching uh, these things concerning Christ. Now, here in Luke chapter twenty four. Uh, let, just look over, it's uh, verse 46, I believe is what it is, Luke chapter 24, verse 46. Uh, we see this, uh, uh, this in just kind of relation to the life of Christ, his death, his burial, as well as his resurrection. It says, and, uh, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. In verse 47, and that, what's the next word? Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And we are living out that very statement that that, that, that Christ charged uh, his disciples with. We're, we are in that uh, process right now, still fulfilling that. Uh, it was supposed to happen right there in Jerusalem as they 
uh, went forward and then it was to carry onward uh, from there to all nations. And we have uh, certainly, we're a little distant from uh, Jerusalem, uh, but we're carrying it out through all nations, through uh, the world. And, it, and as that message was established then, it still remains uh, the same uh, today. That aspect, that repentance uh, should be uh, preached for that remission of sins, uh, of course, in the name uh, of Jesus Christ among all. Uh, remember, repentance is uh, uh, simply defined as the change of mind, but it carries on a little bit further with that. It's to change one mind for the better. Uh, it's to have that uh, 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 amending of what took place in the past uh, that was wrong, the sins. It's, it's having that abhorrence of those sins, seeing those sins differently than how we saw them before. When we engaged in them at the beginning, maybe it was out of a lust and a desire, and uh, we enjoyed what, it, what, what brought about. Then when we saw when God said, that's not right, thou shalt not, uh, we, uh, when repentance kicks in, that's when we agree with God, okay? Uh, you know what? It's wrong because you said it's wrong, and now I feel bad about the things uh, that I have done. Isn't it interesting as much as um, our world wants to call wrong right, there is still a prick in the conscience when people do wrong. And, and I know that we're doing everything we can to eliminate that prick, uh, but you can see it in people's eyes. You can see it. I, I uh, finally um, uh, started back with uh, the troopers a little bit uh, here after all the COVID stuff and did a, a, a ride along with them this past week. And, and um, the trooper I'm riding with, it's, it's kind of interesting actually, because I didn't realize that, that I've been doing this for as long as I have. But now the, the guys that I originally kind of started with that were, you know, newer troopers, they've all, uh, not all of them, but several of them now have um, uh, ranked up and now they're corporals. And of course, when you rank, you have to go to another barrack, you get transferred out. Well, now, as corporals, they're being transferred back to Frederick. Uh, so some of these guys uh, I knew from before, and then they went other places. Now they're back. And so I was riding with one of them, and, and somehow he got on to the, the things of what, what, what he's been doing, things he's been getting up to. And uh, he said, yeah, I've gotten into bourbon now. First of all, I don't even know the difference, you know. Uh, so I had to get some clarification. And then and as soon as it left his mouth, you saw him look over. You don't drink, do you? <laughs> and, and I, you know, for me, okay, look, I'm not the standard, but the Word of God is. But you can see it. I mean, as much as, as they want to participate in some of those things, and as much as they want it to be right, and this is why it's important for us to be living a godly life, because we can help, or we can, the Lord can use our godliness or our godly lifestyle as a way to get the attention of those that uh, are not living that way because, you know, if everyone else is doing it, we can justify it. But if not, then there's something to consider and something to look. So we want to think differently uh, or reconsider uh, those things. That's part of repentance. It's a pricking of the heart. Uh, it's that remorse that we see, that consciousness of the conviction, the consciousness of the things that I've said, the things that I've done, they are not right before uh, the Lord. And ultimately, we recognize it's our sin that it separates us uh, from God. It's what condemns us to hell, uh, and it's why Christ died. And so let's talk about this idea of being uh, sinners, all right? What is one of the first verses that comes to your mind if you were to describe or you were to utilize to help somebody understand their sinful condition. Okay, what is it? All right, do you know that verse? Okay, so for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we can use that verse in relation to what you receive because you have sinned. What else? What's another verse that you think of, Jeff? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, where's that found? Uh, Ask Alex. <laughs> it says in Romans. Okay, we're getting closer. That's all I got. <laughs> Somebody help him out. Brother Larry? 
Romans 3.23. Good. Good job. See, if we work together, we got it, right? We get the scripture, we get the book, and then we can get the reference uh, out of it, all right? Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all right? That is a verse that we should know. We should have memorized, all right? Why? Because we need to utilize the Word of God as the basis for pronouncing the condition that we must deal with. I can walk up to people all the time and I can say, Michael, you're a sinner. And Michael can look at me and go, yeah, what? That's what you think. That's your opinion. You know, or, I, okay, but I'm not as much as you are. I mean, and, and, and all of those things can be true. All those things can be right. But if I walk up to Michael here and I say, but Michael, you need to understand. I know that you think you're a good person and you probably have done some good things. However, here's what God has stated. And God has stated that all have sinned and come short of his glory. Now, are you part of the all? Uh, unfortunately, you are, okay? Uh, so we have to have these scriptures in our, our repertoire ready, accessible, to be able to utilize because we don't know when we're going to get that opportunity. We might it just, in a, in a regular conversation, it might come up and you might lead towards that. And if you go, well, you know, the Bible says that you're a sinner. Oh, really? Where? Well, all over. Okay, open it up. I, uh, you know, have those places that you can reference, all right? Somebody else know of another one? Okay, there's none righteous, no, not one. Where's that one found? Good job. Romans 3.10. Right, Larry? Um, all we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah 53. Okay, good. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray, Romans 3.10. Uh, and actually, uh, verse 11 and verse 12 uh, is good to also reference on that because it's as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, if there is none righteous, are you part of that group? Okay, you, you, you are exempt from righteousness because there is none. Now, why is that, why is that important? Well, 323, and, and this is... Thankfully, convenient for us that you know our memories are not this great. Romans chapter three is a great place to go, okay? Because we got a couple of scriptures we can deal with there. But uh, uh, Romans twenty three specifically states that all have sinned. Romans three ten specifically states there's none righteous. So we're covering both bases there. Not only are we saying that you've done wrong, but we're also saying that you haven't done right. And when you get into those arguments and we're splitting hairs with people, there's, there's, we've left no room to split. <laughs> because not only have you done wrong, but you haven't done right. So which one are you going to claim? You know, how are you going to find the difference in those two? Uh, there isn't. There isn't any room for, well, eh, no. We can stop it right there. Now, verse 11 also says, there is none that understandeth. There is none that understandeth. Now, as we are dealing with people, especially in the area of repentance, what is the, uh, what are we seeking after? What are we trying to help them place to be at? Okay. We want them to see where they stand before God, not in a sense of what they think, you know, or what their own perception is, because we all have that. But we want them to know where they stand for God according to the scriptures, according to what God has stated. All right, what else? What else do we want them to understand in, or a place that we want them to come to? Well, along with what you just said, many times people say, well, oh, I haven't murdered anybody, so I'm okay. Okay. I, I, Good. So we, we want them to come off of the misconception that unless I've committed the ultimate sin, that I'm really not that bad, to the point of if I've committed even the smallest sin, 
I am a sinner. All right, Jeanette? Where the standard is, not comparing to others, but comparing to God's standard. Perfect. So we want them to have the right standard that they are going to make this comparison by. Okay, Jaya? Um, I don't remember exactly where it is, but the verse, I think it's in James, that says something about if you offend in one part, you're guilty of the whole thing. James 2. Yep, James chapter 2. We'll get there in a minute. but <laughs> Okay, so again, we now, now that brings an interesting thing because where do we want them to come to? And, and I want to be careful about the word guilt versus conviction uh, because we have a little bit different meaning than maybe how the Bible expresses it specifically. The Bible does use the word guilt. It does use the word conviction. Sometimes in, in, um, in our vocabulary, we use guilt in a sense of uh, pressuring you to be or to think or to do what I want you to do. And it becomes more of a manipulation type scenario uh, that doesn't really produce change if you use it in the way that we kind of have used it. Uh, my dad used to always use the term, uh, guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, because you, you feel guilty about it, but then it's just like, you're going to feel guilty again. You're going to feel guilty again. It's like somebody just uses that, holds it over your head, you know, and, and so therefore it's like you can never get out of it. You can never do anything about it. Conviction, uh, again, utilizing our term, terminology, conviction would be more of that standpoint of I want you to be, I want you to have remorse concerning the wrong so that you recognize it and can get right. So I, there's, a, there's a change that's going to be produced through the point of conviction. If the Holy Spirit is involved, that's what it wants to accomplish. That's what He wants to accomplish. He doesn't want somebody just feeling bad about themselves. He wants somebody to feel to that point, that remorse, that's going to produce the change and bring it to the other side. Malay? I think the, the police department also does this when they have a traffic stop or they arrive at the scene of a, of a problem, isn't it so that somewhere in there the officer has to tell the accused what, what the problem is? Like, I stopped you because sure. you ran a red light, or I'm here because yeah. somebody had a complaint about you. Right, yeah, we have, they have to state how so, you broke the law. So somewhere there has to be a declaration that there's a problem according to the standards, whether the person agrees with it or not is another situ is another part. Right, yeah. But I think in our witnessing, we have to at least declare to people what the problem is. Okay, good. That's a, that's a good illustration. We have to state pretty clearly there, and we're going to get to that here in just a, just a minute with some of the stuff like the scripture Jai brought up and things of that sort. We want them to clearly understand how they've broken uh, God's law. And that's uh, kind of what fits with this verse here in verse 11, Romans chapter 3. Uh, there is none that understandeth. So again, as I'm dealing with this first aspect of, of witnessing and sharing Christ and, and um, bringing somebody to the Lord, I have to help them they get to that point where they understand their true condition before God. Where they have that, that understanding that, that comes. Now, I have seen this come on people and I've seen it not come on people. I've dealt with people and I can, I can utilize, and, and this is the crazy thing, I can utilize the same method with whatever, five different people, and I can get three or four different responses. You can get the one that it's like, and, and I love, I, I don't know. I mean, as you do it more, you start to, you, you kind of get the, the opportunity to see a little bit more. But I love, I, this is probably the wrong way to say this, but I love to see people come to that point of conviction. And, and, and you understand why I say I love to. Not because I like to see people suffer, I like to see people you know, get, get a good dose of reality of their own wickedness. But from the standpoint of when that dawns on them, it's like, oh, oh. And, and I'll probably say it a little bit later, but I think the scripture even talks about it. You know, 
part of the reason that we bring the scriptures into it is so the mouth is stopped. Have you ever had somebody that just you're trying to share Christ with and they just keep talking? And they just keep letting you know their opinion and they keep letting you know. And everything you bring up, it's like they give you 20 excuses or 20 other reasons why it isn't so or why it really is this and that. And you're finally just like, you want to just look at them and say, shut up. Let me talk to you, you know. But, uh, you know, you got to be nice and you want to, you know. But you see somebody maybe that will respond in a true understanding of the realization washes over them. And they're like, yikes. Now I kind of start to see a little bit. But, the, but then you got the other responses of not, they, there's not an understanding there. The conviction hasn't fallen. There hasn't been acceptance of that. And so it's still a very flippant attitude about the sin. Well, that everybody does that. Or, yeah, I'm still not that bad. Or, you know, yeah, I know, I know I have, but I've also this and this and this and this. And so, man, we just haven't got there yet. We still have to drill into uh, that area because we're looking for this this aspect of the scripture realization to come upon the heart well back to the police analogy we see that there are also some people when they're stopped and the officer says do you realize that you're going 25 miles over the speed limit some people will say ah you're right i was and i shouldn't be doing that mm -hmm. and other people were like no i wasn't yep and so it's this it's that same behavior or, or, or human response to the presentation, you have sinned, you have done wrong. Mm -hmm. Some people will be ready to, to embrace that and go, yep, you're right, it did. Yep. And other people will refuse it. And having sat in the car on the other side when the officer comes back, mm -hmm. I can tell you which response is a whole lot better. <laughs> because if you deny it and oh no i didn't do that especially like cell phones you know when the officer sees the cell phone on your head or sees it in your hand and uh pulls you over and i wasn't on my cell phone you're gonna get a ticket <laughs> um now if you say you're right sir i was on it i shouldn't have been on it you may still get a ticket <laughs> but you also may and if you tell them that your chaplain is, uh, their chaplain is your pastor, I guarantee you'll get two tickets, all right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, talk with your pastor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that would be the best one. You know, I, I, I have to say this. I'm, I, I'm talking to your chaplain right now, and I'm telling him how much I appreciate you pulling me over, you know? Like, uh, that is, I did get a cell phone ticket one time when the law first came into action uh, into thank you uh and here's here's the irony of it it was monday after one of our law enforcement appreciation services <laughs> i was coming back from the airport dropping this special speaker that we had brought in to speak at the and oh man, anyways you know and so the lord was just testing me and i even told the trooper because later i got to know that trooper um, and, and I, cause he did give you a ticket. Oh, he did give me a ticket. Yeah, absolutely. One. Was it? <laughs> cause that's right. Cause you were working here then and you heard me crying about it when I came in. <laughs> cause I was right here behind the church and I tried to get down the hill to the church. So to see if he'd write me while I was in the church, but I didn't make it that far. He got me, but anyways, that's off the subject here. That's confessing my sin, feeling re feeling guilty or repentant. I'm not sure which one, but uh, when you think about it here, there's none that understand it. And the rest of the part of this verse, there is none that seeketh after God. All right, Jeanette, go ahead. Could you stop using your cell phone while you're driving? That tells us that there was... <laughs> I plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> I, you know, I do now have... Uh, <laughs> That's right. I haven't got any more tickets since. Does that matter? You know, um, I do like the sync system though in the Ford truck. That is nice. I don't have to touch it. I can just talk to my windshield and feel good about it. <laughs> Anyways, no more cell phone stuff. Let's get on with this. All right. You guys are distracting me, so you don't feel the heat like I am right now. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Again, use the scriptures. Because what do most people consider? Most people think, oh, I'm, I'm praying to God all the time. 
Ah, oh yeah, I'm going. I, I, I'm okay. The Lord, and I, you know, I, yeah, I do this and I do that. And and, and well, now wait a minute. Let me let me stop you for a second and let me just tell you point blank. The Scripture says you don't understand and you're not seeking Him. Huh? How many times do you hear people saying that in a gospel presentation? How many times do we utilize that kind of stuff in our witnessing? You say, well, you know, we can't be so mean. We're just going to turn people off. No, the problem is that we're trying to be too nice and they're not getting lost and they can't then get saved. And I don't believe we'd be mean and, and, and belligerent. I'm not trying to promote that. But in love, we got to declare the truth. And what I'm finding more and more is when I am bold in the Spirit and I am led by God's Spirit to speak the truth in loving manner, I see that there's a lot more respect on the other end. Even when I tell them point blank, hey, here's the deal. Here's what's going on. You don't understand. You're not seeking God. You're part of the group that is not righteous. But the good thing is I don't have to leave you there, but I need you to get there. I need you to understand that. I need you to accept that. It, it goes on though. They, look at verse 12 also, Romans 3. Uh, there are, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. And this is like to me the kicker of it all. And I'll be, I'll be the first to admit I've been guilty. I know verse 10. I've used verse 10. I haven't carried it into verse 11, verse 12 very often. Partly because I don't have those memorized. <clears throat> But look at the end of verse 12. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. So not only is there none that are righteous, no, not one, but there's none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, now why is this important? Why is the Bible stating this? Because in Romans chapter 3, we're certainly, we're dealing with the, the aspect of you have broken the law. You have committed the sin against the Lord. So as we consider some of that uh, uh, aspects, now uh, anyone else have any other verses that you can think of that have popped in your mind regarding the sinfulness of someone else? Okay, Miss Joy? Okay, very good. Yep, yep, that, that's a good one that you can also bring into as far as there's none that are good is our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we have that aspect. Well, the things that you have done right are not right uh, before God. All right, anyone else? Scriptures you can think of in regards to uh, sinfulness of others? Yep, that good. Do, uh... and, th and that's kind of that next aspect that we will be looking at as far as the consequences right. and the reason, okay, why do we deal with the sin? Well, here's what we deal with, the sin, and then this is the consequences of that sin. Ms. Jackie? Now, <clears throat> I don't have a verse, but I have an issue with door knocking. Right. I, I really do because... There's a lot to take in. You cannot do it in one time. Mm -hmm. And I've had more people say, oh, well, he got saved, he got saved. He didn't get saved, he wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> so that's why I think it's a, a multi-visit multi, uh, or multi-sessions um, with these people. Mm -hmm. You're not just going to win people knocking on their door. Mm -hmm. Give them a track, yes, I'm all for that. but. To give the plan of salvation in 13 seconds is all they give you at the door, mm -hmm. you, you're not going to save them. So it's like I feel, a, and I hate to use this expression, a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I want to sit down with them. I sure. want to I wanna know them. I want to know about their family. I want to know about their history. Before I said, do you, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Mm -hmm. You know? I'm sorry, I just can't do that. Well, and, and there's a whole lot of aspects regarding that. First of all, that is something that has been utilized for how many years? Forever. And so if we go back 30 years ago, 
you know, that sounds like a long time, but I mean, that door knocking that concept goes even further back because I remember doing that well, when we were growing up. In, in, all, in all fairness, how I got saved was someone coming to my house, but I didn't get saved that day. Right. They invited me to church. Right. And it took a year. Right. Gone to, gone to church and sitting in front of my pastor. Mm -hmm. um, to be saved. Yep, but it was a lot more acceptable even 30 years ago for people to come to your door and just have a chit chat, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Neighbors knew each other back then. Coffee, yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, it, we you'd say hi, you'd say bye, you know, you'd, you'd kind of knew a little bit and now it's a lot more like, don't bother me if you're not on my phone or on my computer, I don't really want to talk to you, you know? And so we, we have to accept the fact of the changes in in our society as far as those kind of methodology and practices when it comes to winning somebody right there the first time i mean i i do agree i i think it's it's extremely difficult and and i won't go so far to say it can't be done no, I'm not but it can't be, but, it's... but i would say that there has to be some background of the lord or the Spirit of God having already worked in that individual's heart so that when you get there, it's almost just like a culmination of, okay, let's bring all these things together and that moment really you know, occurs. But I have heard too many of the stories. I just did it to get them out of my hair. They wouldn't leave me alone. They are obnoxious, you know? They, they kept pestering me and maybe it wasn't the first time they came, it was like the seventh time that they finally came and, and, and apart from just being flat out mean and saying, don't ever come back to my house again, it, you know, which people don't really feel like they can do that to a preacher or to a, you know, somebody they, talking about church. They, they never minded calling us and saying, don't ever send the, uh, Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Ever. I love the ones that called and left a big, huge, long message and then forgot to do their address or their name. <laughs> like... Okay, well, I would love not to come back to your house, except that you didn't tell me what house you live at, and I'm not going to not go back to Frederick any place because of, you You know, just to avoid you. So, all right, Mary, you also had your hand? Well, you probably covered it. I was just going to say, I, I, I agree with Jackie some, um, but it was for a different reason. I was, like, petrified to go do it. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't want to, right. and I don't like people coming to my door. But at the same time, I, it was, for me, I really grew a lot in my boldness to be able to talk to people. Mm -hmm. So I think I taught some of them really was lessons. Um, and it was interesting because out of 10 people I knocked on the door, and I had somebody tell me, I'm, I'm from Victory Back, I'm Catholic, slam the door. I mean, it wasn't, you know, always pleasant. But I did have some two or three times in that same day where... I was able to give my testimony, well, sure. why did you leave the Catholic Church? Why did you, because they were another Catholic, and why did you leave, and that kind of thing, and, and then give my testimony. So, I, there, it, you're right, the Holy Spirit led, but at the same time, um, I don't think the total get rid of the whole thing. Right. It's like, and how you do it, right. and what you do, and so. Well, and the mindset that you approach in something, all right, what is, what is the right mindset to have in regards to a method such as door knocking? I, my mindset is not to win them to Christ right. on the doorstep. Right. Um, invite them to church. But my, yeah, my mindset is to engage them. Right. My mindset is to put a kink in their armor. My mindset is to interrupt their life. I mean, yeah, and if, if whatever, you know, way that I can interrupt it, if it's to get them irritated enough to do something to consider what's going on, so be it, you know. Yeah. But hopefully it's not. Hopefully it's like, wow, you know. And there are those people. I, I, we can't under, uh, undermine the work of the Spirit of God. There are those people that are stuck in their house that are looking for answers that somebody comes knocking on their door at the right moment, at the right time, with the right message. They, their heart might just be flooded open with that kind of thing. And it may just lead to their salvation. Well, I was going to say, just like, I had one man, I, one young man I talked to one time, and he's like, why are you doing this? And it was like, and I could explain why we were doing it, and then he brought back all kinds of, like, my mom or my grandmother was a Baptist, and, you know, mm -hmm. and it was like, those, those, like, thrilled my soul. That I mean, so the, you know, I mean, I talked to John 20 doors that day, but three mm -hmm. of them, I had some response, and then someone who said, will you pray for me? Mm -hmm. People sometimes will ask, will you come back? Will you come back? So I do think it, but I do think there's a, I went to a church when we were in California, 
and they would just door knock and they'd say, oh, we got 100 people saved today. Right. But now that, I, I think, is yeah. a problem. Right. But again, that's where you run in the. Where are you? What is your method? What, yep. what is your purpose? And I will say that once I had children and I had to bring, I oh, was yeah. able to bring them along, door knocking got a lot better. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I agree it's not as accepting in today's society, but you would still be really surprised with how many people are willing to actually take you in mm -hmm. and sit down and have a conversation. Yeah. And the whole idea, uh, you know, of it initially is to ask those questions. Like we have kind of a survey that we use, which mm -hmm. really does help it gets them thinking yep. and then towards the end of it I mean sometimes people will say like oh I have no interest at all you know I'm, I'm okay mm -hmm. and that you know that's fine that's that's not the point you're not there to like change their mind at the doorstep mm -hmm. but to find the people that are seeking and the people that want to know mm -hmm. and um, when you ask them those questions it gets them thinking and then you say you know I would love to sit down more with you and have a uh, you know, more conversation, yep. would you like to do a Bible study? And you'd be surprised at how many people are willing. Some of them <laughs> say, Never yeah, hear. I love it. <laughs> Never hear from again, yep. But, you know, just to, to, and people are actually really accepting too <coughs> when you're in the streets, like in a yeah. city. Um, sometimes they're more accepting to talk to you um, just because they're out and about. And um, so yeah. just methods like that. Too. Good, good, good. When was the last time you had somebody knock on your door? I had somebody not long ago. Yeah? And Who I was didn't it? have the heart to tell them that somebody was going to probably call and tell them to stop. <laughs> but, uh, As you went you know, back I, to the back room, hey, yeah. so and so is just. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I told him I you know, was born again and I, where I went to church, and uh, uh -huh. he asked me a few questions to validate that I was saying the right thing. Okay. You know? yeah. So but it was, so was, a uh, so it was somebody who was preaching some of the truth, and it wasn't yeah. one of the cults? No, no. Okay. No. No, yeah, that's church. and that's in an area you're not allowed to do it. At. Right. <laughs> wow. All right. I had somebody come to our door once since we lived in, and they were from another Baptist church in there. Okay. Yeah. All right. I know we had some. We don't have the Jehovah Witnesses. Come yeah, here, we had right? Jehovah's we're, Witness had, or Mormon or somebody. That's the reason I actually don't like to go to order. I don't want yeah. to be seen. I don't want yeah, to be associated with them. <laughs> All right, Brother Dean. No, I'll just say, uh, Bob is online. He mentioned when you were looking for verses, Romans 3.10, there's none righteous. Okay. So it's a little after the... All right, good. So he'll be happy to know that we just went through that one then, right? All right, so um, obviously, as Miss Jackie's brought up, the door knocking method, and, and, I, and I will say, um, you know, God does do... How do, I, how do I say it? God works through things with multiple <clears throat> benefits, okay? So when we get into door knocking, and yes, I mean, again, my expectation is not that you're going to come back and say, hey, we won three people to Christ. My expectation is you're going to come back and you're going to rejoice that God was able to enable you to do something that you didn't think you possibly could do. And you engaged some people, you spoke to some people, you found a, a somebody that you just had a pleasant conversation with. I, I mean, I remember when we were doing the, the, the park outreaches where we went to door to door and we went to the, through the park and we also ate together and prayed, things of that sort. Um, I, I remember, you know, there was a conversation where they came out, invited us to sit on the porch, and we sat on the porch for 30 or 40 minutes just talking. And, and the good thing is, because I'm there knocking on their door, not to sell them landscape contract or not to, you know, uh, most of the time it's uh, who are you promoting as far as a politician? You know, or, or what office are you running for? You know, it's mostly that. And then when they figure out you're not, you're part of a church, that's where the point you either just get shut down, why are you here, don't come back to my door, or you, they, they open up a little bit and they want to talk a little bit, but you've already stated why you're even there, so we already know this is where the conversation is kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, deceiving them in that, you know, we're trying to lead them somewhere. They already know, this is the purpose. This is the reason I'm out here. It's the only reason I'm out here. Uh, is to look for those that are interested in hearing the, about Christ. So, you know, the Lord can work different ways and different things. And one of the things that we've always seen 
uh, here at our church is um, God gives the increase. And so we may go out and we may knock on whatever, so many doors, talk to so many people in the park, and none of those people that we engaged or talked to ever show up. But the Lord brings other people in from other places in which we didn't really have much control or we didn't have much contact, but God was working and God was doing. And when he saw the faithfulness, he blessed it. How do you handle someone who keeps insisting it's individual interpretation? The Bible, you mean? That uh, yeah, first, and yeah. first Peter, um, is it three sixteen? Is it, it's the scripture that says that um, no prophecy is of private interpretation. Is that is that? I'll have to look at that. It's the the prophecy came in old time, not by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'll have to... 2 Peter, maybe. 2 Peter 1, 21. <laughs> For the prophecy came not in old time... Oh, verse 20. Knowing this, that, that this first, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so I, I, I go into the establishment of, you know, it's not what you think and it's not what I think. It's what the scripture says. And there is, there is the proper means and methods to interpret what the scripture says. And I'll just bring something very simple out, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How do you interpret that? Sin. Well, you know, it kind of means, well, if you're part of that group of sinners, then you've sinned. What? Are you kidding me? That, no, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who is all? Everyone. What is sin? Sin is missing the mark, breaking God's law. So all have done that. And they've all come short of the glory of God. So you kind of just use that as a, you know, a basic aspect. And then I would maybe give a little bit with that and say, yeah, there are some things in the scriptures that are difficult to understand. They're difficult to really know exactly what God is saying. But that's the whole reason that we study. That's the whole reason that we depend upon the Spirit of God to help guide us and lead us into truth, but that's also why I'm a member of a New Testament local church because that's the mechanisms that God has brought about to help me make sure that I do understand the scriptures correctly. So I don't know if that's more than what you're looking for, but that's kind of the, the, the path I go. Have you run into that with? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Many yeah. And, and, and not only just with the scripture, but with the different Bibles. Well, you know, oh my gosh, yeah, they interpret it this way, so they sure. you know, a new Bible. You know. Yep, and that's a that's a challenge, and those are those are um, those are uh, arguments that you or challenges you usually run in with, like more of the religious crowd, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that sort of think they know stuff about the scriptures, and and the first scripture that I want to take them to, that I don't always. Um, because I try to be a little bit nice, but the first scripture that I usually want to take them to is the, the devil is an angel of light, and so is his ministers. And uh, so one of the things that he began at the very beginning is to, to adapt and change the scriptures, change God's word. And um, he's been doing a great job at that ever since. And so, you know, yeah, there are other uh, translations of the scripture, but I would be extremely cautious and careful because... The devil's about what he can to change God's word. And the one good thing that we have, which this kind of gets a little bit over beyond, unless you have a good standing with this individual that you can really discuss a, more, um, the, the background and the history behind the interpretations of the scripture, or not the interpretations, but the translations of scripture, can actually, it's real factual evidence that proves the King James Bible is uh, that that best interpret or best translation that we should be utilizing today. And there's some there's some things that are simple. I know we had like a little track form about. I think that one's the New International Version. 
uh, and it just went through several things of why this is not a good translation. Um, there's some other comparison things out there that utilize, you know, the different translations. I have a little booklet about using the King James Bible, things of that sort. Um, I know one of them, uh, the, some of the stuff helps is, uh, okay, turn, turn in your Bible to such and such verse if you have this translation. And when you turn in your Bible, it's not there. And you're like, okay, so can you trust a book that's leaving Scripture out? You know, or one simple one is John 3.16. Um, our Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Uh, the NIV says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. So that means only women can be saved. Everybody's like, huh? Oh, okay. How, how's that? How's it? One and only. Son. Yeah. That means there's no other son. You can't be a son of God. If you can't be a son of God, you can't be saved. See how, I mean, and that's just a simple little word change in there. But Jesus is not God's one and only Son. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. Okay? What's that verse that talks about every jot and every tittle? Matthew chapter 5, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that kind of what we use the, as the basis of why the king, because there's only one. Yeah, we, we, what we use that is, is in light of you, you shouldn't be dropping anything or taking anything away or all scripture is inspired of God. Every jot and every tittle shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. So yeah, that's kind of that preservation of the word of God that we utilize uh, in, that, in that argument. All right, I have a couple minutes left. Any other questions like Mrs. Dawson? Those are good questions for us. There's another one, that made versus virgin. Made versus virgin? Okay, I'm not aware of that one, well, but yeah. The basic problem that we're going to be challenged, we are challenged with more today, is yeah, is people accepting that the Bible is God's word. Right. Yeah. Even mm-hmm. so, you know, there's a training. You know, I would like to be more. You know, that might be something to focus on mm-hmm. and for personal to really become first, like I know and I know for myself and I know for people who aren't going to challenge it. Yeah. But you ask somebody, ask someone who's scale in a class or. You know, how do you, how do you, if someone doesn't believe in God's word, uh-huh. where do you start? Because so, you're comparing that you accept that this is the, the, the you know, standard. Diff- that is and very said, difficult. This is yeah. not the standard, but these people are saying, well, I, what is this even? Or I right. used to think that, but now I don't really believe that it's Yeah, happened. that's so, just a bunch of words from a from men, from men. Right. who wrote things, you know, that right. didn't even have the right perspective right. on so life, period. So to be. Yeah. Now, I will say, in relation to that, the four-week Bible study that we promote and utilize, um, Pastor Doug Hammett was uh, the one that kind of put it together. Um, I have all those lessons recorded, and they're on YouTube, right, Jaya, through? You can find them on our website, I mean, on our YouTube channel, uh, or search out four-week Bible study, Victory Baptist Church, something like that. And there's four lessons each lesson is broken into two videos because I didn't want them to get too long. I know, I don't ever have a problem with that. But, yeah, so we try to make them a little bit shorter so people would be more apt to listen to them. But the very first lesson uh, of that series deals with the validity of God's Word. Now, it's a very general, simplified way of looking at it. Um, it talks about you know how many years... The Bible was written from the writing of Genesis to the finishing completion of uh, uh, Revelation, how it spanned a time of like 1,200 or 1,400 years, 1,200 years I think it was, something like that, Um, and how you have over 40 different authors, you have two different dominant languages, also uh, you can put one more, some of the scriptures are written in uh, Aramaic, right? Uh, And and so you have, you know, Hebrew and Greek, you have these, these... simple, straightforward facts that actually help prove just how miraculous God's Word is. And if you can get somebody to kind of look at those basic facts, then a lot of times they'll back you out of that and go, ooh, maybe this is something that I really should consider. And it also mentions historically, it's completely 100% accurate, scientifically, it's 100% accurate. I like to use the one about washing your hands. When doctors were delivering uh, babies, they were having a very high mortality rate. And one doctor figured it out 
and uh, his mortality rate for infants and delivery went way down and all the other doctors were looking at him like, what are you, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm washing my hands. And they were like, what? Yeah, I read my Bible. And a Bible talks about the cleansing of the hands. So I started washing my hands. And so when they were working on these, these older patients that had some you know, fatal diseases and they were dying by them, they would take, you know, work with them and then they'd walk right over and deliver the baby. And they'd carry everything from that to the little baby and the baby would die. And so this guy figured out if I go wash, and of course that's a very a practice of the day. Uh, the Bible declared the world brown before oh, yes. Columbus ever discovered it was around, right? Yeah. Uh, the circle of the earth. Uh, so there's a lot of things like that. And then, of course, if you start bringing even more facts and figures into it, you can really build a very strong case for uh, God's Word. And we do. We have to face that today because a lot of people are challenging that. And here's one thing that you'll never... Uh, one thing that you always can remember is the changed lives that have occurred because of the things of this book. And you are one of those that is presenting this to uh, those individuals. All right, a couple more scriptures and then I'll be done. Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7, 20, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. It's Ecclesiastes 7, 20. Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful, above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And of course it talks about the Lord searching it. Romans 3, we've, dis we've talked about that. Romans 5, we talked about, uh, or oh, Romans 5, 12. Romans 5, 12, we didn't talk about that one actually. Wherefore is by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, why? For that all have sinned. These are scriptures that you should be able to have, that you can uh, provide people with. 1 Timothy 1, 15, so faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sinners, sinners, of whom I am chief. First John 1 John 1.8, we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The next time somebody tells you, I've not really done anything wrong, then you look at them in their eyes, and you say, you just called God a liar. And then see what happens. <laughs> and if you need backup, there it is. First John 1. <laughs> yeah. um, I just want to say one thing. I was at a service with my family down south, and I was sitting there in the service, and because they used so many versions, I walked out of that service thinking, number one, when he was talking, it sounded like just, you know, he was reading scripture, but it sounded like just somebody was speaking, mm -hmm. just a person. You know, versus, I know people complain about these and thous, but when you hear a thee and a thou, you automatically associate your mind with God. And then the other thing is, was people had so many versions, it was like, and, and some people were just, they didn't even know what he was talking about. Right. Because, I mean, which, you're not reading it together, and anybody that teaches knows, if you want to solidify a truth, you know, when you see it and hear it, mm. But and the I, confusion. I, about, right? I thought about confusion. The word confusion came into my mind. Yep. Yep. All right. We've got to go to the next service. So let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for the things that we've been learning here this morning. I do pray that they would be edifying for each and every one of us, that we would take the challenge of uh, just interjecting into the lives of those that you place us in contact with. Help us, Lord, to be bold. Help us to be wise. Uh, Father, help increase our abilities, our, our talents, um, that we can truly rightly divide your word and utilize it in effective means uh, to help others to understand their sinful condition before you, knowing, Lord, that that's that, that first step in which they need to understand to bring them to you uh, as, your, as their father. We love you, Lord. Help us as we continue on here this morning. In this way, ask in Jesus' name. Amen.